praise to you, O Christ. Welcome, Christine, to deliver our sermon this morning. Well, hello, everyone. Here we are about to enter Lent, and um, usually, I guess I would be urging you to think of denying yourselves, taking up your cross and facing all the rigors of Lent. But given the rigors of lockdown and um, our present context, I don't really feel I need to do that. I think if we all accept that we are where we are, that's enough of a, a Lenten rigor. This, this actually is rather a multitasking Sunday. Not only is it the Sunday just before Lent, but it's Valentine's Day. It's also the day when in Sweden, our friends in Vekwa diocese are celebrating St. Siegfried's Day, their patron saint. It's Racial Justice Sunday and Green Christian would like us to mark Valentine's Day by expressing some love for planet Earth. Well, we marked Racial Justice Sunday towards the end of last year, if you remember, when Ian spoke to us. And um, at the beginning of March, we'll be thinking of um, climate justice. So I'm not going to be specifically referring to those. What I want to do today is focus on the theme of friendship. So let's begin with Valentine's Day. If we could have that lovely heart again. Um, thank you, yes. I do like a bit of romance. So Valentine's Day is one of those days that I do quite look forward to. And of course, in the Northern Hemisphere, this is just when spring is beginning to appear. Winter is still around us, it's cold and dark, but we can sense that spring's around the corner. And it's in spring, as Tennyson says, that a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love, or lust for that matter, and the same for a young woman's fancy. There's a sort of reaching out for relatedness, something that takes us out of ourselves, out of winter into spring. Romantic love is a great start to a relationship. But it's often friendship that helps it last, enabling us to see our beloved through ordinary spectacles, as well as those lovely rose tinted ones. So friendship, first of all, friendship between lovers. Now, if we could have the St. Siegfried picture, please. I've spoken about St. Siegfried before, He's an English monk from York who set out with a group of monks and his three nephews in the 11th century to take the gospel to Sweden. He's said to have built the first church there. And this statue of him stands outside Vekwa Cathedral in Småland, the diocese that we're linked with in Oxford Diocese. I'm sure that the bonds between him and his monks and him and his nephews were very strong. They would have had to be given the, the rigors of travel, the sort of opposition they would face and the um, climate that was so harsh in Sweden as it still is. I think there would have been real friendship between those men, friendship between colleagues, friendship with family members. So friendship between lovers, friendship between colleagues, friendship between family members. And now let's go to our gospel passage, the transfiguration. So if we could have the icon of the transfiguration, please. Our readings this morning are there to encourage us as we enter Lent. And as we start to anticipate the cross, as we did in that hymn between our two readings. Immediately before the transfiguration, Jesus has been trying to explain to his disciples, a group of disciples, about his suffering and his death and rising again. 
something that they failed to understand. Now he's taking three disciples, Peter, James and John, up a mountain, a setting that's traditionally associated in um, Hebrew tradition, in our scriptures, associated with encounters with God. And it's rather as though he's pulling back a curtain and enabling them to see something of his identity and his calling. He wants to share this mystery with his close friends. He wants them to understand. There's Elijah on his left, and you may remember Elijah climbed a mountain after he ran away from Queen Jezebel, and it was on the mountain that he heard the still small voice of God and was told what he must do next. So Jesus is saying to his friends, I'm in that prophetic tradition. I stand in that line of prophets. I can expect suffering and opposition. And then on his right is Moses, the lawgiver. And you may remember that when Moses came down from the mountain after speaking with God, his face shone. Moses went up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. He's mediating a covenant between God and Israel. Like Moses, Jesus will be mediating a covenant. But this will be a new kind of covenant, which involves his offering up his life. Then there's the voice from heaven that makes it clear that although Jesus stands in the line of the prophets and of the law, he is something much greater than that. We hear the voice from the cloud. This is my son, the beloved. And the dazzling light around Jesus also makes this point. It's such a dazzling spectacle that Peter, James and John fall to the ground and almost out of the icon itself. Our, our uh, lectionary gives us this particular scripture as we face Lent. In Mark's account, Peter, James and John still don't get it till after the resurrection. Even though Jesus knew that they probably wouldn't get it, he still shares this experience with them. He treats them as close friends. One of the bishops in my last diocese used to talk about the different groups of people around Jesus. There was the crowd. They often turned up, sometimes of considerable size, but they weren't necessarily committed. They were on the edge, as it were. Then there was another group, a fair sized group of disciples who did follow Jesus around, but not all the time, nor did they necessarily share kind of a communal life with Jesus um, as, as a rabbi with disciples. They are referred to in our gospels simply as the disciples. Then there were the 12, the ones that we know by name, those who were closest to Jesus and who shared his life, traveled with him, stayed with him, ate with him, um, very, very close to him. And then the three closest, Peter, James and John. We might say that the crowd had a sort of passing acquaintance with Jesus, while the groups of disciples were his friends but in varying degrees of closeness. He would teach them, he'd explain parables to them, but only with his closest friends would he share glimpses of his identity as God's son. And also, let's note, his, his vulnerability, his human vulnerability. And in, in doing that, he was inviting them to share in that intimate relationship that was his with God the Father. Intimacy with him, intimacy with God the Father. The Gospels were written for the encouragement of people like you and me who want to follow Jesus. 
And at the start of Lent, we might like to think of where we place ourselves in those groups that um, my bishop used to refer to. Perhaps we're in the crowd, a sort of observer, just watching, but not necessarily wanting to get too involved. Or perhaps we're part of that big group of disciples hanging out with Jesus, but not actually sharing his life to any great extent. Or one of the 12, those closest to him, really sharing um, everything he's doing, where he's going, what he's eating, all that sort of thing. And then the three who were the most close to him, perhaps a bit more like his soul friends, we might say. Wherever we place ourselves, Jesus is always inviting us to draw closer. He's inviting us into his friendship, the friendship that he experienced with God the Father, the friendship that he offered to his disciples, and that's us now as well. What would it be like to stick with Jesus as a close friend during his time in the wilderness, for example, facing temptation? What would it be like to stick with him when he was raising Jairus's daughter? Or to stick with him in the Garden of Gethsemane? What experiences of our own might we risk sharing with him? Looking at our reading from the Old Testament, fabulous reading about Elijah and Elisha, we can see some risk taking in the relationship between Elijah and his, at that time, servant, Elisha. Elisha knows that Elijah is going to die and he's determined to stick with him right to the very end. And he goes on a very roundabout route to do that. He's not going to be put off. So he's present when Elijah dies and is whisked off to heaven in chariots of fire. The narrative suggests that this, in the end, was more than a relationship between a master and his servant. Elisha actually calls Elijah father at the end. There's clearly a great bond of friendship between the two prophets. And it can perhaps be an insight on the influence that friends have on each other. Elisha receives a portion of a double portion actually of, of Elijah's spirit. And that can happen in friendship, can't it? That, that we receive a bit of the other person's spirit. Um, and that can often be a very life-giving thing. It's something that we can share with one another. So Jesus invites us to relate to him as his friends, to trust him with our highs and our lows just as we would with a best friend. And, and this is really important, he trusts us with his highs and lows. We get a glimpse of the high in the transfiguration. And the next time that he takes his three friends aside, of course, is in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he entrusts them with his deep human vulnerability. He offers us that gift the glory and the vulnerability, two sides of the same coin for Christ. Well, as it says, I think in one of John's letters in the Bible, you can't say that you're a friend of Jesus if you're not a friend with each other. So I wondered if this Lent, we might just note our friendships um, and, perhaps particularly remember our friends in Lent. How are we keeping in touch with them? How, how willing are we to listen when one of our friends is telling us something that's really quite difficult? How easy is it for us to stick with a friend um, during some of those very difficult times that some of us are going through at the moment? And do we, can we really risk sharing some of ourselves with our friends? Do we risk sharing a bit of our vulnerability with one another? 
I, I was reading an interview with a, a young man called Tyrell Lewis, who was um, involved in gang crimes in Brixton and now runs the Brixton Street Gym, where he remembers Pastor Mimi on his estate, a true friend, as well as his minister, I suppose, who would ask questions like, how's your heart? How's your mind? How's your spirit? She was a friend who helped him to go deeper and who helped him to turn his life around. I think she might have passed on some of her own spirit to him, actually. Friendship between lovers, between partners, between colleagues, friendship with family members, friendship with our sisters and brothers in church, friendship with a kindred spirit, a soul friend, we might say. How are we doing in our friendships? And where do we stand in our friendship with Christ as we approach Lent and the events of Holy Week and Easter? John's Gospel is where we read most about Jesus calling people like you and me his friends. So I'm just going to close with a quote from John's Gospel. Jesus says to his disciples, I have not called you servants, but friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Amen. Amen.